from New York to our TV and radio audiences worldwide. Welcome to Balance of Power, where the world of politics meets the world of business. I'm David West, and we're going to start the program today with a market check, because equity markets are up on some news that perhaps, perhaps the coronavirus crisis is easing a bit. And for a full report, we go now to Abigail Doolittle. Well, David, we do have stocks higher on this Tuesday. The S&P 500 right now up about 2%. Off its highs, at the highs, up about 3%. And as you were mentioning, this probably does have to do with folks out there thinking that uh, there are signs that the coronavirus, the spread, uh, is easing. But what makes this so interesting, just yesterday, David, you and I were talking about how the big uh, driver for stocks this week could be bank earnings. Quite frankly, they're pretty miserable. J.P. Morgan's uh, profits plunged to the lowest since 2013. Wells Fargo withdrew their net interest income uh, outlook. So you can see banks sharply down, that KBW bank index down uh, about 2.8%. Uh, so a real divergence there. And as a result, there is another divergence. We may have risk stocks higher, David, but we also have Haven bonds and the yen higher. The Haven yen, uh, that Japanese yen, now up for a fourth day in a row. So it tells you not everybody is believing leaving uh, not just the rally today, but the rally that we've had in recent weeks. Yeah, Abigail, in fairness, you can't blame investors. They don't know exactly which way this is going because I don't think anyone does. So you yeah, had the bank staff started up a bit and then they came down, as you said. At the same time, I think some of the stocks that have been beaten down pretty badly have sort of come back, haven't they? That is a big piece of the rally over the last couple of weeks. And one reason that some strategists and traders out there don't like it in terms of the companies that had uh, been hit so hard by the virus back in uh, January, February, and March, such as uh, the leisure companies, the airlines, uh, there has been a bit of a bounce back over the last couple of weeks. So some are saying that the rally that we've had off of the lows from March, that there are holes in it. And if you take a look at a year to date chart of the S&P 500, it's really pretty incredible because there's that huge move down 35% from the peak to the trough. Now we're about halfway uh, back up. It's very hard to know which side where the greater risk is it to the upside. Don't fight the tape and the Fed or is it to the downside that we don't know how bad uh, the economic repercussions of this virus cri crisis will be? Some are saying that we really need to see not the numbers for the first quarter. We already know that's horrible, and most quarters uh, companies have pulled their guidance, but it'll be the second quarter when it's a full quarter of the economic toll, not just March. So lots of uncertainty out there. Year to date, you can see down about 12%, but today we do have stocks higher, David. Great. Thank you so much to Abigail Doolittle for that report on the markets. In the meantime, because there is some reports that perhaps the coronavirus is easing a bit, we're starting to think about how to return the economy to full steam. And there's a tug of war that's developed between the President of the United States, Donald Trump on the one hand, and some of the governors across the country. Yesterday with Donald Trump saying he got to decide when we started. Some governors saying they have their own plans. For a report, we turn now to our White House co correspondent. He is Josh Wingrove. Josh, welcome. So what is going on between the White House on the one hand and some of our nation's governors? Well, I think it's a sort of hot potato back and forth uh, in a way where the president is saying he has this uh, absolute authority. Now, it's a little unclear as to what he bases this on. The vice president seemed to think that these were emergency powers as opposed to overarching blanket authority, but the president seemed it, to think it was the latter. And so we've had New York governor and others uh, pushing back against that. Uh, saying that Trump is setting up for a constitutional crisis if he were to order a state like New York to open ahead of when the governor says is, you know, the right time to do it. So that's the sort of jockeying that we're having right now. Uh, Cuomo is saying we, uh, we, we don't want a King Trump, we want a President Trump. I was curious, because you cover President Trump regularly, I was curious what your take was, because although he did say, I have the authority to do this, I also heard him say, you know, the governors who resist me will have a political price to pay. It didn't sound like he was saying it was legal. Is he basically setting them up, basically, to blame them if things go wrong? Yeah, I think, I think that that's true. Uh, yesterday's press conference was a doozy uh, by any measure. I know they're not often boring or brief affairs, uh, but the president, I think, you know, I think that he's clearly uh, trying to put himself in the driver's seat of this. Uh, you know, he's been he'd been playing nice for a while with the governors. That's sort of eased off a little bit now, where he's sort of uh, turning to them. He today referred to them as mutineers in one tweet, and so we'll see. If, for instance, in the next few days, as Larry Kudlow said a few moments ago, the president announces guidelines for states to begin taking steps and it's just a voluntary thing, then it's, you know, not going to be a huge crisis. But if Trump gets up to the podium and says, 
everyone should go back to work no matter what your governor says, then we're going to have a different ballgame. Well, and in those remarks, Mr. Kudlow suggested that the president's looking at a rolling reentry. It's not going to be like flipping a white life switch. I wonder if there's a really big difference. But I do know, Josh, that I don't think the president set out national guidelines for when we shut it down. Why does he think he should be setting the guidelines for opening it back up? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think he is really anxious to get things back to work. Of course, he was running, you know, two months ago, he's running on for re-election on the economy pretty much squarely. We wrote overnight, though, that, listen, you know, the, the step that they need to reopen things is testing. We just simply do not have enough testing. We don't have enough testing to test people with symptoms, let alone turn and contract trace all the people those people have met, let alone just do random testing to catch outbreaks before they pop up. And we don't even have a full antibody test, or at least not something that's widely available. So we don't know who's had it, we don't know who's recovered, and we don't know that if you've recovered, you have immunity, and if you do, for how long. So there are just so many unknowns right now. Testing will really be the key to solving this. And until that really ramps up, and we're talking, you know, multiple times what we are able to do right now, uh, you know, eight, eight times or so uh, by one estimate, then really a, a full reopening just isn't in the cards. That's the one thing everyone seems to agree on. We need a lot more testing to reopen the economy. Thank you so much to Josh Wingrove. He reports in the White House for Bloomberg. And now it is time for Bloomberg First Word News. And for that, we go to Mark Crumpton. David, thank you. Former President Barack Obama has endorsed Joe Biden for president. In a video message, Obama said his former vice president has, quote, the character and the experience to guide us through one of our darkest times and heal us through a long recovery. He added, quote, Choosing Joe to be my vice president was one of the best decisions I ever made, end quote. The Trump administration has eased a ban on exports of personal protective equipment. Bloomberg has learned there are now exemptions for exports to Canada and Mexico. Lawyers pointed out the shortcomings of rules rolled out last week. The U.S. medical system is grappling with shortages of masks and gowns for healthcare professionals. The European Union's chief Brexit negotiator is back at work. Michel Barnier had tested positive for coronavirus in March. Barnier said he would hold a video conference with UK Brexit counterpart David Frost tomorrow. Frost has also been isolating after showing symptoms of coronavirus. Japan is planning to begin cash handouts for those hurt by the pandemic as soon as next month. The country is planning an extra budget of $156 billion to try to offset the economic effects of the virus. The number of cases in Japan has climbed to more than 7,600. The country was put under a state of emergency last week, but many people were still seeing crowding shopping areas in parts of Tokyo. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. Thanks so much, Mark. Coming up next, France extends its lockdown even as its economy really struggles. We go to Paris and Nicholas Dungan, he's a fellow at the Atlantic Council, for a full report. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. The French President Macron yesterday announced that he would be extending that lockdown in France, a very firm lockdown, until at least May 11, even as they've revised downward twice in the last week their economic estimates for the country. We welcome now Nicholas Dungan. He's a uh, visiting fellow with the Atlantic Council, and he's resident in Paris. We always turn to Nicholas when we need to know what's going on in France. So, Nicholas, first of all, start there. What is it like on the streets of Paris today? empty. There's basically nobody outside, and there practically hasn't been anybody outside since this started on the 17th of March. There's no traffic, and um, you know, you, we've seen all these pictures of empty streets, empty monuments. Uh, that's the way it is. At the same time, clearly this is taking a real toll on the French economy. As I say, we've had two revisions down. Now, I think they're projecting something like an 8 percent down for the GDP. Uh, are, are people basically understanding why Mr. Macron needs to do this? Does he have the support of the French people? Yes, I think he does. They're understanding that this is first and foremost a health crisis. 
And unlike in the UK and unlike in the US, uh, actually uh, people have sort of put off the economic issues until after the lockdown is over and everybody can go back to work. Um, the concept is, as you know, that we have a very strong unitary state in France, and basically everybody's going to expect the state to pick up the tab. How they redistribute that later in terms of borrowing and raising taxes is another issue. But that is not the central issue. The central issue is the health crisis, and that's what he was addressing last night. By the way, he had almost 90 percent of French adults watching his address on television. It's the largest television audience in history for a French president. Wow. But at the same time, some of your neighbors are not taking the same approach because we're now hearing some places are starting to back off on some of the restrictions. Certainly, we're seeing that in Austria. We're seeing it in Denmark. But now even talking at least parts of Italy, parts of Spain, does that make the situation more difficult for the French and for Mr. Macron? Well, interestingly enough, all of the confusion and all of the uncertainty that Josh Wingrove was just talking to you about a few minutes ago about the United States applies in Europe as well. And, and the reason is that this is not just a global crisis. It's, it's, it's also a crisis that affects everybody in different ways. So um, health is not a competency of the European Union. So it's not surprising to find different European Union countries taking different actions based on their culture, their own health systems, their own outlook for the economy, their own politics. And that emphasizes the fact that in Europe, as is the case everywhere else, this is not just one crisis after another, like the financial crisis, which was financial, then economic, then social, then political. This is everything at once. So <clears throat> it's not really surprising that we're getting different assessments in different countries and different political decisions in different countries, even though they're right next to each other. But what it does demonstrate is that the supranational institutions, the multilateral institutions, were not built to deal with this sort of thing. And only the national governments, and in some cases, for example, in the U.S., the, the local and state governments can actually make sense of this. So, Nicholas, give us a sense, since it's all driven by the virus itself and its effect on people, what is the situation right now in terms of increased number of cases, deaths, I'm sorry to say, but also the pressure on the French uh, national health system? Actually, the health system has held up pretty well. Um, it was very, very close to being saturated in the Ile de France, which is the greater Paris region and the region called the Grand Est, which is Alsace, Lorraine, Moselle, Champagne, Ardennes. But that's held up pretty well, and there were transfers of, of sick people uh, to neighboring countries, and Macron asked to thank them last uh, light, night in his address, Switzerland, Germany. Uh, they also transferred people from the northeast to the southwest on military airplanes. So that's been managed well. I think the the major, and, and the, 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 it looks like we're coming to the top of the curve here, but we've seen other countries, you know, we've seen also more cases, for example, recently in Italy, so you can't ever be sure. What, the problem here is there are virtually no masks, not very many gloves, and no tests available. So what you were talking about uh, with your uh, correspondent earlier with Josh Wingrove, the, the lack of tests is going to be the pro big problem. And unlike Germany, France doesn't have enough tests to test that widely. So they're basically only testing people who are symptomatic. And that probably will continue to be the case. Macron promised last night that as of May 11th, there will be enough masks for every member of the population. And that is something which, you know, the government is going to have to pull out of its hat. But the other problem is, quite frankly, and this is, goes back to your question about his leadership and and his popularity ratings, he was very humble. He said, I've made mistakes. I need to rethink myself. We clearly weren't as ready as we should be. But there actually weren't very, aside from this May 11th date, there weren't very many specifics in what he had to say. It was that's when things are going to start to unlock down, and the government will be publishing the directives and the, and the, and the instructions in the next few weeks. So... It wasn't totally clear uh, what's going to happen. We, we know there won't be sort of summer music festivals. 
Uh, we, we know a few things. We know that restaurants and cinemas won't open right away. But what we don't know is when people can get back to work and when people can begin to lead, you know, a, what life used to look like. What we've seen thus far from what's been said about Austria, Denmark, places like that, and even as I say, Spain and Italy, is it's differentiated according to ge geography, certain parts of the country as other parts of the countries, and also certain business classes, there's differentiation. Is there a differential effect in France before, between, for example, the large cities on the one hand and the rural countryside on the other? Sure. And there's also a difference within the large cities. And, and some people have been predicting that there will be uh, class conflicts uh, afterwards or class pressures because who's at work? The guys who, keep, who clean the streets are at work. The police are at work. The, the, I was talking, this is just a personal anecdote, but I was talking to the cashier fellow in the supermarket the other day, and he said, yeah, he's driving 40 minutes each way to come into work in France and sit you know, behind a plastic shield in, in the supermarket. Everybody who, everybody who can work from home, who's you know, computerized and doing what the French call teleworking, uh, has it much easier. It may be very difficult to be confined in your apartment or your house. People in the country, people who are 20 percent of the French pop, of the Paris population, sorry, left Paris to go to their country houses. So, in fact, what you've got is a situation where it's not only different from country to country, but it's for different, as you say, for lots of people within the country. And, and the, 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 the people who are frontline workers are not only the medical frontline workers, but the people who are uh, keeping the place ticking. There are still bus drivers working. There are still people you know, driving the metros around. Uh, there are still some taxi drivers because they need to make a living. Uh, and, and they think that you know, everybody else who can work from home or doesn't have to go into the office, has it a lot easier. So we'll see whether those tensions rise to the surface later. For the moment, obviously, you can't see them because, because everybody, everybody's locked down. Is, Nicholas, finally, is it just too soon for a country like France, or for that matter, the United States, to start talking about what you talked about, the supranational bodies? Because at some point, this is a global pandemic. We're going to have to deal with it globally, and yet every country seems to be worried about themselves. IMF, for example, France has said that the United States doesn't want to support an additional $250 billion in special drawing rights for, for some of the troubled countries. Well, that's right. And, and if you think about it, um, the, uh, as I said before, the problem, it, there are two problems. One is that this affects everybody differently, even though it affects everybody. We've never seen anything like this before. And the second thing is that it's all five crises at once, health, social, financial, economic, and political. And so these different responses, obviously France has a different feeling about Africa than the United States does. Um, right. the, uh, some of the changes that we'll see will be slow, such as I think... Uh, Clearly, China right. is, we're too dependent on China, and, and we'll end up, you know, people right. uh, pulling their supply chains back. But for the moment, the supranational institutions are not providing answers, and that is going to be a big strain right. on the international system going forward. Yeah, no, no question about it. Nicholas, really appreciate your joining us from Paris. Stay safe over there. Well, thank you. It's Nicholas Dungan, he is a visiting fellow with the Atlantic Council. And coming up here on Balance of Power, we're going to talk about banks. We've had earnings from J.P. Morgan and from Wells Fargo this morning, and the, the market didn't particularly like what they had to say. We're going to talk with Shanae Basak about that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the banks started their earnings season today. We had reports out of J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, and we're going to get the rest of the big ones in the next two days. Here to give us an initial report, at least, is Shanali Basak, who reports in the banks. So, Shanali, initially the market seemed to like what, the, the, what J.P. Morgan and uh, J. Wells Fargo had to say, but then they changed their minds. 
Here's the thing, David. Even though initially we saw massive loan loss provisions from both J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, the reality is we don't know how much worse it will get into the second quarter. And we also don't know, for example, how long it will be until most of their customers are able to really pay back a lot of their loans. The forbearance measures have taken effect into a lot of their clients. A lot of people have been drawing down credit lines. And the reality is right now it's not so bad, but we don't know how bad it, it will get. So that uncertainty is really starting to burn at people. So Shanali, how much should we read into the next three big earnings that we got coming up? Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, City, and things <laughs> like that into what we saw so far today. Or are there banks, is there a divergence here about their exposure? There will be a very significant dispersion in, in their exposure. If you think about it, City has an enormous international business that we have to consider because those international clients will also be reporting a different set of issues. Then we also have Goldman Sachs, which has a big merchant bank to consider in terms of their private investments and how that will fare as they build a $10 billion war chest to deploy into private deals. At Bank of America, which is kind of the more immediate concern tomorrow morning, net interest income, where we know will be lower at JP Morgan and at Wells Fargo, will also be of interest tomorrow morning when we see Bank of America's figures. We'll be looking at those loan losses some more. But on the trading desk side, we did see great numbers from JP Morgan. We don't know whether those figures will hold up as strongly at the next set of banks that are yet to report this week. Well, I was going to ask you that specifically because I did see the trading numbers were really quite good for J.P. Morgan especially. Does that say something, for example, for Morgan Stanley or from Goldman Sachs that in the past at least has really relied upon trading? You would hope so because both of the banks that you had named, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, a lot more of their revenue does come from trading and investment banking where deals have been very muted. Debt underwriting has been great, but we have not had that much luck in the advisory and IPO businesses. And that fell lower than expected at J.P. Morgan. But with fixed income uh, shining so brightly and Morgan Stanley being the leader in equities and trading volumes being where they are, the hope is here that trading will hold up for this quarter, yet that's in hindsight. We don't know what the next two quarters are going to look like. Yeah, and of course, one of the things everybody's going to be looking at is controlling a cost because we know it's going to be a rocky road for the banks. But that's the initial one, the last, the first two of the five. Thank you so much, very much to Shanali Basak. Basak. Coming up, here on Balance of Power, we're going to talk to the Massachusetts Attorney General. She is Maura Healy. She is doing, she's using her office to try to protect those most vulnerable to the coronavirus crisis. Maura Healy, to Massachusetts Attorney General, coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Banks all around the world are doing their best to try to help their customers through this extremely difficult time globally. And that includes RBS. We got to talk exclusively with the chairman, Howard Davies, earlier today. And we talked with him in particular about what the, his bank is doing for small and medium-sized enterprises. It is very important because they do create a huge amount of employment in the country. And... For many of them, of course, there's been a complete stop on their business. I mean, the most obvious ones being restaurants and hotels, but a lot more, too, who are in the supply chain for the leisure and tourism industry or indeed for manufacturing industry, which is largely closed down. So it is absolutely crucial. I think the, the really key thing is that we need to ensure that there is productive capacity in the economy for when the opening up and the upturn eventually comes. Because if we've lost productive capacity because firms have just given up during the crisis, then we will have a constrained upturn. So it, it's both important on the downside, but it's also very important to position the economy better for the upturn. How difficult is it going to be for these businesses? I mean, you mentioned, for example, restaurants or, you know, uh, merchants, uh, service businesses that are collecting zero revenue right now, but getting loaded up with debt, some of it with very high interest rates, relatively high interest rates. Um, how hard is it going to be for them on the other side when they come out of this pandemic loaded up with debt? Well, I'm not sure about that in all cases uh, at all, because 
First of all, the furlough scheme from the government means that they can recover most of their employment costs if they're eligible for that, and many, many are. Also, the Corona Business Interruption Loan Scheme, or CBILS as we now know it, does not have an interest rate in it for the first year. So most people whose businesses are is, whose business has clearly been interrupted by CBILS and who are eligible for this scheme will be taking on additional debt, but it will not be at an interest cost, now, well, at least for the first year. Now, of course, the, the question is whether in the long run those will be viable with a larger amount of debt on their balance sheet. And I suppose the honest answer to that is some will be and some won't be, which is why I think the government and others are now looking at whether, in some cases, there is a need for an equity instrument at the end of all of this, whereby some uh, entity, some government-backed entity perhaps, takes an equity stake in businesses where they can't survive with that huge amount of debt. Now, that's a problem in a way that we hope we will have, because that's more of a problem of the reopening than it is of the close down. But at the moment, the loans available are at zero interest for the first year under the government scheme. Do you expect some kind of debt forgiveness? There's been a lot of talk about a jubilee um, as a banker. I'm not sure if that uh, rubs you the wrong way. But is that a possibility on the other side of this, Howard? Well, I guess it, it is a possibility. It's not something which would be uh, at all easy for the banks themselves to do, because, of course, our money is all somebody else's money. So if I'm forgiving a debt uh, to a, a borrower, uh, I'm also uh, you know, spending your deposit, um, which is not something I guess you'd appreciate. So if that is going to happen, there's going to have to be some public sector involvement in it uh, somewhere. Uh, because I don't think the banks would be sensible, sensibly advised to do that. But from anything else, if, you, if, if, a, if a bank creates a big hole in its balance sheet, then credit is going to be constrained when we eventually do reopen the economy. And that is absolutely what we don't need. Because in the last financial crisis, of course, the problem was why the recovery was so weak for so long, uh, is that banks who had big holes in their balance sheets couldn't extend credit on the scale they had before. Now, this is not the same crisis at all. This is a real economy, a health crisis, not a financial crisis. But what we must avoid doing is turning it into a financial crisis and getting into a situation where the economy cannot turn up because of a credit crunch. So that's the calculation I think the government have got to think very hard about. That was RBS Chairman Howard Davies is an exclusive discussion with our very own Matt Miller. Well, sometimes crises can bring out the very best in us, and unfortunately, sometimes the worst. And sometimes we need our legal authorities to make sure it's the former rather than the latter. We now welcome somebody who's on the front lines of that effort. She is the Massachusetts Attorney General. She is Maura Healy, and we welcome her now. So welcome, Madam Attorney General. Give us a sense of what you're finding with Massachusetts. What have you needed to do? What actions have you needed to take to protect the most vulnerable among us from this crisis? Okay, I'm so sorry. We're having some technical difficulties getting the Attorney General from Massachusetts. We're going to make every effort to come back and get her shortly. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, this coronavirus crisis, this pandemic, is affecting individuals and clients all the way around the world. And we welcome now someone with a specific vantage point of that. He is Joe Andrew, and he is the chairman, global chairman, of Denton's, which is the largest law firm by number of lawyers in the world. It has offices in 73 different countries. So he has a particular perspective on what's going on. So, Mr. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Give us your sense, because you're talking to a lot of clients around the world, what you're seeing. How badly are people hurting? Who's benefiting? Who's hurting? Well, thank you, David, for having me on. And uh, people across all the world uh, are both hurting, and uh, there are a few that are benefiting. 
Um, we're all dealing with a very unusual time. I was supposed to be in Africa today and Athens, Greece tomorrow and Munich, Germany uh, uh, on the weekend. Instead, I'm speaking to you, of course, from my home office in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's this great old Welsh word that I always use called haris, and haris is a word that means homesickness for a place you cannot return to. And I think a lot of people who are more international travelers like I am are, are seeing that right now. Uh, as I speak to clients uh, all across the globe, uh, what I hear for them is not just a lamentation for what they wish they could do, uh, but they're each trying to figure out how to manage this next new normal uh, depending upon whether or not they can bring their business as virtual as they hope it could be. And, and whenever you have a crisis like this, there's a certain amount of mourning or grieving for what has been, and there's changes that we all have to adapt to. Uh, some of them are tragic changes, actually. At the same time, it also can create whole new areas of practice. For example, uh, is your bankruptcy practice growing as a practical matter? And oh, by the way, there's a lot more laws and regulations coming out of, for example, the $2 trillion being appropriated. Are you having to deploy lawyers to get into that to figure out for their clients how they can take advantage of what's being provided by the government in order to keep the go economy going? Uh, absolutely right, David. What's happening, of course, is uh, lawyers are back uh, to the extent that we were perceived as a commodity before this crisis. Whenever you're having to make a big change, looking at a strategic move, uh, whether or not you are considering bankruptcy or just have contracts you need to find new ways to renegotiate or litigation that is being threatened to you because of the changes, uh, you need to have your lawyer in the room. So while many lawyers across the globe were, again, perceived as a bit of a commodity, just as something that was a necessary evil. For the first time in a long time, they're having big picture strategic conversations with their clients about the client's future. Uh, it's too early, perhaps, to think about what longer term changes might be, but you said the fact that you, you're on a plane all the time around the world to your very offices, meet the clients. Do you think that might change? We won't have as much of that going forward. It, there's no question that it will change. Uh, we see clients who are talking about on, on sourcing, about bringing different component parts of their supply chain back to whatever their home country is. And of course, unfortunately, there might be a rise of nationalism and a lot of finger pointing about who's responsible. But certain parts of globalization have truly become virtual. And I'll tell you a quick story. When I was in Uganda just uh, about uh, uh, late November before the crisis all began, I met a young woman who was receiving a scholarship uh, because she was awarded a genius grant. And at age 14, I asked her how she did all of this, and she simply held up her mobile phone to me. And she said, uh, you know, I have access to the same libraries in the world, the same research. I can do anything I want with this simple phone connected to a solar panel in my small village where I live in a hut with a dirt floor. That type of globalization, that democratization of ideas, where we have people all across the globe who can now actually turn that creativity and that intelligence uh, onto the world's problems, onto the world's challenges, that part of globalization is going to be furthered about this. You're going to find people who really perceive themselves in a new generation as global citizens at the same time that they'll find that more things may need to be manufactured right in that small village. And finally, Joe, I want to take advantage of you while we have you here. Just for 30 seconds, 45 seconds on politics, because you were the chair of the DNC at one point. We now have a vice, a President Obama now endorsing Vice President Biden in addition to Bernie Sanders yesterday. This is all over, but how different is this election going to be, given what's going on with coronavirus? Uh, it, it's really impossible to exaggerate how different it's going to be, David. We've just never seen an election like this. And we've also never seen an election that obviously is started so early. Uh, you can argue the election really never ended uh, from uh, 2016, but we clearly have a nominee of both parties much earlier than we've had in decades, at the same time that neither of them can go out and meet people. Uh, they're both going to have to rely on a virtual campaign. They're both going to have a very different dynamic with conventions that are exceptionally late, so access to federal money will be much smaller than it ever has been before, as well as one candidate and Vice President Biden, uh, who has been sidelined by not being immediately involved in the solutions to the crisis. I think the reality of it is this was always going to be 
essentially just a vote on the qualities and the character of the incumbent, uh, that it almost did not matter who the of the Democrats was uh, because of the polarization there is over the incumbent president. And so whether or not that changes the outcome or not is a very different question, but it's certainly going to be a very different campaign. Yeah, indeed. So many things are so different. Thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate you being with us. I hope you come back and give us a report again. That's Joe Andrew. He is global chairman for Denton's, the world's largest law firm. And now we want to go back to the question of Massachusetts and the attorney general. As I said, these crises really affect people differently. And we've particularly seen some of the less fortunate among us and some of the struggles that they have. They tend to be more prone to have the underlying health problems, and yet they have fewer resources. And so one of the questions we have and our legal authorities have is how how can we do our best to protect them as, uh, from people who could take advantage of them or just the system which does not treat them as well as otherwise they might? One of the people who's really leading this fight is Maura Healy, and she is the Attorney General of Massachusetts, and we welcome her back now. I'm so delighted that you were patient with us. We got you back because we wanted to talk to you, Madam Attorney General. Give us a sense of what's going on in Massachusetts, what you're seeing, and what you're doing. Well, you know, a few things that we're seeing. One, you see people out there on the Internet, um, Instagram, Facebook, they're marketing coronavirus vaccines, treatments. All of these are scams. And so in response, we go after them and quickly try to shut them down. Um, we also see people who are setting up these charities where they pretend to be asking for support to support coronavirus victims. And again, they're scams. And so we're just encouraging the public to really do their homework before you ever um, give money like that to to what you think is a charity. We've seen a lot of, um, of lately, a lot of people reaching out uh, via phone call or on the internet, promising small businesses disaster relief and you know help pretending to help them with their application for that federal money, uh, which people are so desperate for. And so we've been really clear with the public: only go through the public sites to apply for and obtain um, that relief. Um, but it really runs the gamut. I mean, recently there was a woman named uh, Suzanne, um, she called herself, who was calling around offering to help people with their student loans uh, for a fee. So we're monitoring this. We're encouraging people to report these scams to our office, and we're taking action as we see it. So, so do you have something like a hotline, uh, Attorney General? We you, do. You, In Massachusetts, do we have a hotline a set up. Um, and we also have a way for people to file directly online or through social media with our office. So we've got those, those lines fully staffed up. We had to, to fight off unlawful debt collection, price gouging, you know, that began a few weeks ago, and similarly for these types of scams. If you discover these, what can you do about them? Your court system's closed down, isn't it? Can you take people into court? Well, it, it really ranges. Some of this stuff is coming from overseas, so it's harder to chase. But, I mean, sometimes it's just a matter of, of tracking down who owns the site, uh, calling them, sending cease and desist letters. We've had success doing that. We also make sure that we warn the public immediately um, so that they're on the lookout for these kinds of unlawful solicitations. Look forward uh, to a more hopeful time, for example, when we get a treatment or we get a vaccine. Uh, how will we make sure that people can afford it? Because unfortunately, the wealthy have the first access to these things. And yet a lot of the people, as I said, who have been most badly affected have not been the wealthy at all in most communities. No, it's so true. Um, and not only um, are they having trouble accessing health care. I mean, our, our whole health care system is so strained right now. And, and you see the, the holes and the failings there. But, you know, remember, a lot of these folks are frontline workers. Um, but a lot of these folks, too, uh, have been laid off. They've lost their jobs. And so we're going to need a whole uh, safety net and, and a whole lot of uh, funding to, to support them and to, uh, to help them through this time. And so, you know, this isn't a weeks or months long endeavor. This really is going to take us, um, I think, years to, to recover from, to rebuild from. But, you know, my hope is that we rebuild in ways that are more equitable, that deal with some of the underlying disparities that – you know, result today in, in black and Latino populations disproportionately being uh, affected, uh, sickened and killed uh, by the coronavirus. So we've got a lot of work to do, um, but with this devastation comes a lot of opportunity to rebuild in a more positive direction, I think. 
Well, that's, that's very hopeful on your part, and I hope that you're right, goodness knows. Uh, at the same time, you mentioned the health care workers. Uh, there are some reports some places that per perhaps people have been hoarding some of the personal protective equipment, things like gowns and masks and, and gloves. Is there a way for you to discover that and go after it? Is there any legal recourse? Well, there is, and some states have actually issued orders that uh, prohibit that kind of stockpiling. We, through our office, have um, you know, encouraged the public to make donations to turn over what they have for PPE that is so desperately needed right now in our hospitals and on the front lines. Um, and we're also uh, encouraging the public to, to donate. You know, We've had a lot of just companies that happen to have um, PPE. Um, these weren't even necessarily healthcare companies um, who are donating that. We've also seen in Massachusetts a really wonderful effort by many of our manufacturing companies who you know, may have been making athletic apparel, but now are turning around and making masks or making gowns. And you know, every little bit helps right now in this time. Yeah, we heard your governor, Charlie Baker, just yesterday identify some of those athletic uh, companies who are really donating things. Uh, turn to a different issue because up in Massachusetts, uh, again, your governor, Charlie Baker, announced this tracking and tracing pattern with Partners in Health really to try to uh, isolate and identify the people who, are, who have the virus and might spread the virus. Does that raise issues for you in terms of privacy? Because we now see Amazon and Google, for example, are saying they're going to have an app up that will tell us who we've been in contact with. Do we have to consider that balance, or is this a bad enough crisis we say, look, we need to worry about saving people's lives. We'll get to the privacy later on. Well, I think it is a matter of public health right now. That is the priority. That, that said, there is a way to do it to account for people's privacy. I think you need strong, uh, this has to be government-led, um, so that the right protections are made in place. But certainly whatever we can harness from the private sector, we should be looking to harness. And the fact of the matter is uh, we're not going to see the economy open, as many people are clamoring for, until and unless we have measures in place to uh, do that contact tracing, to uh, test to see who has the antibody um, and may be able to, to return to work to see who's had the virus, right, um, and, and who's come out of it. And ultimately, we do, you know, we do need to get to a vaccine. So I think people need to be patient. It's a terrible situation, I know, for, uh, for, for everybody. Um, and, you know, I, but the fact of the matter is until and unless we have these measures in place, we're not going to be able to um, open, open things back up. And uh, we've got to get that right, and we've got to put public health as the priority ahead of everything. And a final area, Attorney General Healy, if I may, is I mentioned before the court system. I'm not sure what's going on with the court system in Massachusetts, but you have a big office that has a lot of business and a lot of work to do without a coronavirus. What happens to all that work when we have this crisis pending? Can you do both at the same time, or do you have to suspend a fair amount of what was going on just so you can focus on the issues surrounding this crisis? Well, you know, it, it's a good point, but fortunately we have been doing both. Um, our office went virtual uh, weeks ago, so everybody's been able to, to work safely from home. They're preparing briefs and filing briefs um, in court. The courts, while um, not operating the way they used to in terms of not allowing people in and out, are nevertheless taking electronic filings. They're having telephonic hearings and video conference hearings. So that work continues. I certainly have set up within the office a COVID response team. And, you know, we have many people across the office working on this. We have our healthcare folks working, our consumer folks working. In the early days, they issued re uh, regulations to, to end debt collection and price gouging. Um, we've had to, to work on other economic issues like working with the utilities to stop shutoffs in people's home of, of their utilities, uh, working to make sure that workers are protected. Uh, our Fair Labor Division is, is active, you know, fighting for workers for paid uh, sick leave and, and the time they need to care for themselves and their families, but also that they're working, whether it's in a grocery store or, a, or an Amazon distribution center, with the right kind of PPE, you know, equipment to protect themselves. So it's been a full-out effort from um, my office, but I think you, you know, you see the scope and the breadth of, of our Attorney General's office and, and what it's capable of. Um, but we've also kept all our hotlines open, and you know, the work the work continues. It's it's just done in a different way. We've certainly learned a lot about, you know, the fact that we're able to to work um, and, and accomplish a lot um, through video conferencing and and telephone uh, conferencing right. and the like. Um, but we found a way to continue. Yeah.
Yeah, we're all learning an awful lot, but that was really helpful. I'm delighted that we got you back. That's the Attorney General of Massachusetts, and she is Maura Healy. Thanks for being with us. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. While we've been having our program here, President Trump has been meeting at the White House with some survivors of the COVID-19 virus. And among the headlines coming out of that, he said that he plans to announce a plan, a deadline to reopen the economy, as he put it, very quickly. This is part of that tug of war that he's having back and forth with several state uh, governors about exactly who decides and when we are going to reopen the economy. Maybe part of the reason he is optimistic is he thinks that that Gilead drug, remdesivir, is actually having some good results and is promising. So President Trump continues to be the optimist, as he says, he's the cheerleader for the nation. That does it for Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston.